Hello and welcome to episode one of the Slip and Weave podcast. My name is Dakota. Um, I wanted to start this podcast off by uh, just kind of introducing myself. Um, I'm basically just a huge boxing fan who um, has been watching as many fights as I possibly can since I was probably nine, ten years old. Um, I've participated in the sport kind of on and off over the years and um it's always just been a real big passion of mine and um i think like any good fight fan one of their favorite things to do is talk fights and it it doesn't feel like there's a really good um fans fan podcast on and i'm hoping that um my experiences uh in the gym and the ring um I can bring a level of respect to the sport um, and to the conversation. Um, there are a lot of people in the boxing media that you hear talk about boxing and, and be critical of fighters, um, and I doubt that they've ever taken a punch to the face. Um, so I'm hoping that while I'm not a fighter, that I can bring some of that, um, that tactile experience to this podcast. Uh, and make it make it interesting for you guys and show people why uh, it's a sport that gets me so excited. That's one of my favorite things is that, you know, when you're watching boxing with someone that, you know, maybe doesn't have a lot of experience watching. And there's like that moment where there's a part of the game that clicks and then they can enjoy it more through that understanding. I love that. I love that moment. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm just hoping that I can be a good fan Um and, and and make interesting conversation and um you know i had a, a go at this about 10 years ago i had a youtube channel where i was doing predictions and whatnot and um and it was a great experience i was i was a little young maybe to understand some of the opportunities at the time um and i think that this is a this is a cool second opportunity um when i was doing the youtube predictions podcasts weren't really as much of a thing and it seems like that's a medium that people are really interested in that they've really gravitated towards towards the uh the long form conversation um so yeah let's get right into it man let's talk fights it's uh it's 2020 now we got a new year and i figured the first thing we could do as we're introducing ourselves to each other is uh go through some of the some of the fights this year from 2019 that i felt like were the most impactful the most entertaining the most meaningful um, so I really, you know, as as much as there's gr so many great fights this year, um, it was a good year for boxing, I would say, as a whole. Um, there's sort of five that I've narrowed it down to that I felt like were the most meaningful for the sport or for me. Um, and for the most part, it seems like they came on the back half of the year. The first one that came to my mind when I was thinking about this was Manny Pacquiao and Keith Thurman. Um First of all, it was a great fight. It was a very evenly matched, well-contested fight. Pacquiao dropped Thurman in the first round. Um, and I think ultimately that kind of wound up being the difference. Um, the other main difference being, and the thing that I thought was the most impressive, was that it felt like every time Manny hit Keith, he really hurt him. Um, and that wasn't necessarily true the other way around. Um, Manny Pacquiao is still a, uh, an amazing specimen at 40. He's still one of the best fighters in the world, um, and he showed it against one of the best welterweights on planet Earth right now, um, and a guy who's beaten some top guys. Keith was a a really good opponent, man. He really hit Manny. If I was honestly, if I was if I was a part of Manny Pacquiao's team, I wouldn't want too many more fights like that, you know, that were that physical because it was a hard fight. It was a hard physical fight, but Manny just proved that you know he's still special enough that you're going to have to really do something more than just, you know, hit him a little bit to beat him. He's so fast. His combinations are incredible. Um, so that I thought was, that was, uh, to me, that was one of those examples of the old fighter still has, you know, uh, a lot left in the tank. And he clearly does. I don't think that there's a lot of guys that can beat him right now. Um, the second one that came to my mind was Errol Spence and Sean Porter, which was September 28th. That was two young guys in their prime taking each, taking the hard fight 
we're taking a hard fight. It, it's cool how all those PBC welterweights are fighting each other right now. Um, it's good for the sport. Um, I'd like to see them fight Terrence Crawford, but we'll get to that a little later. Um, yeah, Errol and Sean, man, I thought it was just two guys really um, at the height of their game. And I thought Porter, you know, especially after I saw him fight Ugas, I didn't think he won that fight. And I didn't know um, how he was going to handle Spence's power, speed, defense, movement, all the, you know, height, all the advantages that he has. How would Sean handle that? And he really got right in his chest and stayed there, um, which he didn't do against Ugas. He tried the box. I saw what he was trying to do, but um, Ugas was just so sharp from the outside and was able to, you know, tag him coming in on the way out. You know, he really put his mind to keeping Spence, you know, either on the ropes or right within range of him. He was always ready to punch. And Spence used his speed, his reach. He was just a a brilliant boxer, man. He made Sean miss a lot, and he made him pay. And it was a classic, classic welterweight fight. Um, Really enjoyed that. Really enjoyed that. I like how, I really like how the guys in that division from PVC are fighting each other. I think it's it's really good for the sport. I know I just said that, but you know there was a time a couple years ago where the, he had all those guys signed and they weren't really fighting each other that much. Um, I think it's just kind of moving the needle forward as much as anything. Um, there was another fight, Octo- uh, yeah, October 18th, and it was Alexander Gvozdik. It's a tough name to say against Arthur Betterbiev. It was on ESPN. Uh, two light heavyweights. Um, and this fight, I just really enjoyed watching, man. It was two guys that, um, I believe, uh, better be of his Russian Vojdik is from the Ukraine. Both have, you know, incredible amateur programs. Um, and it was just two highly skilled guys, man. Two really skilled guys matched up. Um, it was pretty 50, 50 right up until the very end when better be caught up to him. Um, and to me, better be of sort of solidified himself as one of the best and most explosive fighters in the game right now. Um, I know he's a little bit older to be like a a prospect. I believe he's 34 now, but he's got 15 professional fights. They're all knockouts and it looks, it kind of looks like he's still getting better. Um, so it'll be interesting to see the light heavyweight division is very, very stacked right now. There's a lot of really nice looking fights for him. Um, and it'll be interesting to see because I like, I kind of liked uh, Vojdek going in. I thought he had the edge as far as being technical, being um, really light on his feet, having fought at this level, beating, you know, Adonis Stevenson. So I felt like he just sort of had the edge and experience and in a, a lot of different things. Um, but I thought it was a classic fight. It was one of those instances where it was the two best guys fighting each other at a time when the fight maybe wasn't that marketable. You know, I think it might have even been on like a Friday night. It wasn't even a Saturday night fight, which is, I guess, typically what you think of when you think of the big fight. Um, but it was a it was a great under-the-radar top-level fight that if you haven't gotten a chance to watch that one, I would go back and watch it. It's, uh, it's a lot of fun. Two really top-notch guys. <clears throat> on... Uh, on November 2nd, this was another one I wanted to talk about, um, Canelo Alvarez fought Sergey Kovalev, uh, moving up two divisions from middleweight to light heavyweight. I know he had fought at super middle, but he was essentially thought of as a middleweight. Moving up two divisions to fight Sergey Kovalev, um, who at one time was one of the most vicious punchers in the whole sport. You know, he was knocking guys out with jabs to the body. And was just thought of as kind of a Deontay Wilder type where it's like it's only a matter of time before this guy clips you and changes the the course of the night. Um, but in recent years, he has taken a couple L's. You know, he's he lost to uh, Andre Ward twice. Both were a little sketchy to me, but he did lose. Um, and then losing to a lady or Alvarez, then beating him in a rematch. Um, but he's definitely not Sergey Kovalev from 2014, 2015. Um, 
But when they made the fight, I thought, you know, I thought it was a huge risk for Canelo to move up that much in weight against a guy that big. Um, even though Kovalev is 36, even though he had only fought, you know, two months before that and it was a tough fight, um, I knew it was a risky fight. That's always risky when you move up that much in weight. And it's cool to see, you know, maybe the top guy in the sport want to take those risks, you know. And I know there was people kind of, I don't want to say bitching and moaning, but I heard I heard and read things that were critical of him not fighting another younger, more um, vital light heavyweight. But um, it kind of hit all the big three, right? Kovalev is the big name. It's a big challenge. And it makes money, you know. I don't see why... Um, I don't see why his first time moving up to light heavyweight, he has to fight the 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 most difficult possible guy he can fight. I thought he took on a perfectly um, a perfectly dangerous challenge, and I thought the fight kind of played out that way. Even though Kovalev, you know, the, his approach in that fight was really more up on his toes, staying long, not really sitting down on anything to take punches in response. You know, one two, one two, out staying behind the jab. And Canelo really took his time. He moved his head. He made Kovalev miss most everything he threw um, and just bided his time. He bided his time. He was slipping a little body shot now and then, you know. And you could see he could feel as Kovalev started to fade, he would sort of up it one notch, up his intensity one notch. Um, And he kept doing that. And then in the 11th round, uh, it kind of came out of nowhere. It was such a 50-50 fight because of Kovalev's activity, Canelo's precision. Um, and in the 11th round, it was like you could see Kovalev wilt just ever so slightly. And Canelo put his, put his foot on the gas and landed an overhand right and then a left hook that put Kovalev to sleep. And it was spectacular. It was spectacular. And it wasn't like it was a... You know, a Gotti Ward, Corrales Castillo type fight for 11 rounds. It was a pretty technical boxing match, but it was entertaining. They were kind of right in front of each other, um, and it was an interesting chess match. And then the explosiveness of the knockout was really fantastic. It was really, I thought that was a really special fight. Um, So kudos to Canelo for stepping up, taking the challenge, you know, moving up in weight fighting one of the maybe three or four best guys in that division. Um, I thought that he made his case that he's the best in the world. I don't I don't think there's anybody else, if you look at his resume right now, you know, the guys he's fighting in the context of when he's fighting them, I feel like he's the best in the game right now, and that fight really proved it. Even if Kovalev's a little old, man, I think that uh, if he wasn't really special, he would have lost. Um the last fight from 2019 I want to talk about is um, a fight that was the conclusion of the World Boxing Super Series for, uh, I want to say, bantamweights. I hope I'm not fucking that up. 118 pounds. And it was Nonito Donaire against Naoya Inoue um, from Japan. And this fight was kind of like Thurman Pacquiao, except the reverse, where the young guy in Inoue ultimately won the fight, but um, Nonino Donaire has been around for years, man, he's been around for 13, 14 years, whatever, as a relevant fighter, <clears throat> so for him to be able to move down from featherweight, I think he was up at at one point, and fight the baddest little guy on the planet, I mean, I don't, I can't think of anybody below featherweight that's more of a badass than Inouye. This kid's knocking people out. He's vicious. His power is the real deal. He can box like a motherfucker. And Donaire really gave him everything he could handle. You know, I read that he broke his orbital bone and his nose. That being Inouye, he broke those bones. And Donaire was really hitting this kid, man. He was really hitting him. His speed was great. His timing was really good. Um... He knew exactly when to answer. You could see that veteran experience. You know, he could he could kind of tell when Inouye was taking his play away. Um, and he would always answer with something. I thought the knockdown late in the fight, I can't remember exactly what round it was. Um, 
But the knockdown late in the fight, I thought really, you know, stemmed the tide a little bit. Um, and and Anouye pulled away for that last two rounds. And that maybe was the big difference because it was a pretty close fight up to that point. I thought Anouye probably won eight, nine rounds. But just an absolute classic. Um, and those are the kind of fights you – these are the matchups that, that fans want to see. You know, they want to see the, the best fight the best. They want to see the best fight the best while the best can still fight. Um, and they want to see – compelling narratives I think um at least I do I love the narrative of Canelo and Kovalev moving up you know Canelo moving up the two weight classes you know basically being a junior middleweight the whole first part of his career and then you know moving up to fight this guy that was a killer three four years ago just an absolute knockout machine um compelling narratives man I think good matchups Fighters with good fan bases. Um, these are the fights people want to see. So in the spirit of fights that, you know what I'm saying, fans want to see, I figured I wanted to try to narrow it down to, you know, the handful of fights that I would really like to see next year. I know a lot of people are talking about this, but there's really just a handful that, as much as there's a lot of great matchups you can make, these are the ones that really stick out for me. So the first one I want to talk about, which I said I would reference earlier, I want to see in 2020 Terrence Crawford against anybody relevant. That's what I want to see. I want to see Terrence Crawford against anybody relevant. And that's a really, that's a by any means necessary time in his career. I think he's 32 or 33 now. Um, and he's an incredible talent. There's like, there's no denying that he's uh, a, a, an incredibly special talent. But sometimes it's a little hard to gauge that talent if you're not seeing it against top guys. And the promotional divide between Bob Arum and Al Heyman um, ultimately is what has prevented that. I mean, the PBC has put up graphics of welterweight champions and not included Crawford. It's that divided. Um, but by top guys, I'm talking Errol Spence, Pacquiao, Thurman, Sean Porter, Danny Garcia, Mikey Garcia, uh, Ugas, any of those guys. He really can't be picky. He really can't be picky right now because he's 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 at that point in his career kind of where Golovkin was a couple of years ago. Where if he doesn't start getting these big fights now, by the time he gets them, he's going to be just on the back end. Um. And maybe that's not true. Maybe if he got all of his big fights in four or five years and he was in his late 30s and he's preserved, that he's still a great fighter. That's a possibility also. But I think the fans want to see it now. I think you don't want to let him get stale. I think you want to keep him engaged. And the other side of it, too, is we've seen, particularly this year, a lot of upsets in boxing. You know, Joshua Ruiz comes to mind. Um Julian Williams and Rosario, you know, there's you, your spot is never safe. There's always somebody that wants it. So I think it would be a, a, a real shame if Terrence Crawford never got the chance at one of these guys to show how special he is. And then, you know, maybe lost his edge and lost to somebody he shouldn't lose to or whatever the case may be. You know, sometimes you just catch a punch. That's boxing. Sometimes somebody just puts you to sleep. And there's no rhyme or reason to it. Um, so let's see in 2020, Terrence Crawford versus anybody. Anybody, anybody, anybody. Can't be picky. Look down and wait. If you got to fight Josh Taylor, take that fight. No pickiness. I don't want to see anybody that's not in the top 10 at 147 or 140 against this guy. There's no reason. The last guy he fought was tough. I'm not saying he's a uh, Kavaliauskas. I'm not saying he wasn't tough. He was a tough kid, but um, let's see somebody real, man. Um, the next one I want to see, which I guess is counterintuitive to what I just said a little bit, but I, in 2020, I want to see Errol Spence versus Manny Pacquiao. That's a fight I really want to see. I think w let's just get it while Manny still got it. Let's get that fight going while Manny still got it. I think it's a fascinating fight. I'm not really even sure who would win because Errol's at the top of his game and he's so incredible and 
Manny Pacquiao is sort of the last of an era, and he's really, um, he's still very much a special fighter and a force to be reckoned with. So while Terrence Crawford is fighting somebody of merit, you know, those guys are both PBC. It's a real easy fight to make. Let's get it going. It's kind of now or never for Pacquiao. Um, And while I don't want to say, you know, when he's going to retire, obviously he's special enough where it looks like he's just going to be good until he retires. He's going to be a good fighter until he retires. He takes care of himself. He trains right. You don't get to that point if you don't do that. But um, I would love to see that fight this year while we know for a fact that Manny Pacquiao is still a beast. Um, And I hope that Errol Spence is healed up from his his accident and that he can come back and still be um, the fighter that we've really all grown to enjoy. Um, So that's one I want to see. I also want to see Gennady Golovkin against Demetrius Andrade. That's a fight I am dying to see. I'm dying to see somebody step up to the plate and take on Andrade. I love this kid, man. Demetrius Andrade, the skills are unreal, man. His defense is great. His boxing ability, his jab, his speed, his IQ, the way he move, maneuvers around the ring. He Obviously, he's not knocking a lot of guys out, but it seems like he, every time he fights, he puts somebody on his ass. Um, the kid's obviously got some pop. I would love to see him in with Golovkin, man, because we know, you know, maybe Golovkin's not the same Golovkin, but he's still a vicious puncher and a great top-level boxer, and it would just be a first-rate middleweight showdown. Um, They're both with the zone. You know, I know Golovkin wants that third Canelo fight so bad, but I wouldn't count on it. This is the fight they both need to make for their legacies. I think they both need to make that fight now. That should be that should be that should be the goal for twenty twenty if you're Eddie Hearn is to get Andrade and Golovkin in the ring together. I think that's a great fight. Um you know, and Andrade's fighting on Thursday against some guy I don't know. And I think it's a real shame. I think it's a bummer that none of those guys will get in the ring with him. They're gonna have to at some point, or maybe not. I don't know how that works anymore. You know, maybe these guys all just have to wait till they're in their late 30s for money fights now. Maybe that's just sometimes how it goes. You know, if guys aren't just super willing to fight each other. But hopefully in 2020, that's something they can put together. Um, there's there's a couple more I want to see. The, 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 the main one that I would really, really like to see is Canelo against Arthur Betterbeev. I think that's an absolute banger of a fight. If you go back and watch Better Be of Ngovojdik, I think you'll understand why I like that fight so much. I think it's a a great matchup. It'll be a legitimate challenge for Canelo. Um, I hope they get that on. I hope that's a a possibility for him. Um, I also really want to see Tank Davis and Lomachenko get it on. You know, Tank is coming into his own. He's in his mid-20s now. He's looking strong. He's looking good. He fades a little in fights. I think it'll be a good gauge of his skills to see him in with Loma. I think he's ready for that, but it doesn't look like that's how they're moving him. So if they can't get Lomachenko, I hope they can find some other champion, you know, some kind of legitimate test for him. Um, But Tank Davis and Lomachenko is a huge money fight, and I think probably they both know that. So expect that in the next year or two, I would say. Um And then lastly, what I really want to see in the heavyweight division is I want to see the winner of this Wilder Fury rematch fight AJ. Once and for all, let's get a heavyweight champ in 2020. One guy that we can say is the heavyweight champ that's got all the belts. Um, Wilder and Fury fight again in February, February 22nd. Um, It's looking like Joshua's going to have to fight a mandatory against Pulev. Kubrat Pulev Um, should be... Uh, should be a win, not an easy win, but it should be a win. And hopefully by, you know, the summer, um, that's a fight that can reasonably get made. Um, so that's my wish list for 2020, you guys. Um, I've really enjoyed doing this. Um, I've wanted to do this for a while. I'm hoping I can get better at it and get more comfortable with it. Um, you know, I'm starting with boxing because it's what I know and, um, it's uh, it's it's my greatest love, I would say. As much as that's fucking corny and shit, it's kind of true. Um, so 
Um, but hopefully, you know, we can get to know each other and, and branch out. And, uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to doing this every week. Um, so, yeah, this has been episode one of the fucking Slip and Weave podcast. My name's Dakota, and hopefully I see you next week. Take it easy, guys.